Hey guys, what's going on? Mike Musto here with, of course, of course, Dan of Stoner. Course. Of course, Dan Stoner. <laughs> and we'd like to welcome you back to the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. So on this episode, this is pretty cool because one, we're going to be talking with journalist and author extraordinaire Alana Schur. We're going to Love be talking her. about, she, well, Alana's one of my favorite people um, yeah. in the world. We're going to talk about the 2021 Dodge Ram basically T-Rex, right? This is the new Hellcat-powered Ram pickup. It's the Raptor Fighter. Um, we are going to talk about how the lack of events, public events, has affected myself and Dan on a personal level. Absolutely. And then we are going to talk about a wicked tea bucket that Dan found in the Hemmings Classified. So yeah, yeah. stay tuned. Welcome to another great episode of the Hot Rod Barbecue, and we are going to get started in one minute. All right, so this is pretty cool. So this week, Ram came out with this big announcement about the 2021 Ram TRX, or uh, T-Rex for short, is basically what, what they're calling it. Is that what we're it. supposed to call it? We're supposed to call it the T-Rex? Is that what they're... I think it's the T-Rex. I okay. think that's what... The, yeah, it's and it's it's basically a, a, a full-on Ford Raptor fighter. I mean, it's... Dan, have you seen this thing yet? You know, I've seen some video of them, you know, basically sideshowing the thing out in the desert, which kind of... That kind of belies the entire approach of, I would imagine, this T-Rex thing. It's like, yes, it's powerful enough that you can do sideshowing. At the same time, if you're going to sideshow, you might as well do it in the desert, right? right. <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like the ultimate desert sideshow machine to me. Yeah, right? I, you know what? I think you're right. I mean, when they, we knew that, I mean, you know, Dodge FCA, their whole thing is just Hellcat the world, right? right. Let's let's, right. let's put a Hellcat in everything. everything. And I think people were were jazz and they knew it was coming that it was eventually the hellcat motor was going to make its way into a ram right which yeah we could we thought that well, i guess we could have assumed that was coming right yeah yeah so one way or another. yeah and i mean it's 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 aimed directly at the ford raptor it's a 6.2 liter supercharged v8 707 horsepower 650 pound feet of torque um it's rightfully quick like if you drag race this thing it'll do right. i think zero to 60 in under i think it's four and a half seconds yeah, um, it's about as aerodynamic as a bookshelf. Yet that thing will do <laughs> zero to a thousand miles an hour in about three seconds flat. Like, how, you know, how do you even? What, what do you even say to that? I, you know? you know, and I think you know that that type of speed on thirty-five inch tires, yeah, off road tires. You know, and in, it's eight inches wider. One hundred eighteen mile an hour top speed. Yeah, well, that that's got that's, that's tire limited. It has to be because I don't yeah. I don't want to do 120 on off road tires. Do you? I can't even imagine. I can't yeah. even imagine. You know, I mean, I'd like to try. Let me put it that way, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want I mean, to see how it's... what that takes. So let me ask you. So what do you think the Ford guys are talking about right now? Because the the yeah. Raptor is the EcoBoost, the twin turbo V6. Right. 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 So right. do you think that by Ram coming out with the Hellcat power for the T-Rex, right? Do you think everybody at Ford is going, ooh, because where yeah, they're I, doing low displacement turbo, you know, FCA is just like, just monster horsepower. You know what I mean? I mean, I got to believe if I was anyone else, Ford, GM, whoever, if I was anyone else looking around at what Dodge was doing, you know, with that thing, and especially just going monstrous cubic dollars, I would say, yeah, maybe we should have, maybe we should have seen this coming, and maybe we should have done something about this. You know, do you, because, do you right. think that Ford will eventually repower the Raptor with the seven two that's coming out? Well, I would like to think so. I would like to. Think yeah. so. I mean, the Raptor's been around for a while now, right? And yeah. I think everyone knows what a Raptor is or what it kind of looks like. And I think it's also yep. fair to say that uh, we've seen enough YouTube videos of people like you know basically general leeing a uh, launching Raptor. Raptors, <laughs> yeah, uh, and seeing what happens with those. So you know, now all of a sudden we've got something with some big monster cubes, and uh, <laughs> I think that I would, yeah, I think I would love. I'm much more. I'm almost more interested in seeing what the competition is going to do in answer to the T Rex, as much as I am yeah. a T Rex. You know, yeah. And do I want to know. Think... I mean, can I ghost ride the whip on that T Rex? Can I if I'm sideshowing in the desert? Can I ghost ride <laughs> that whip? Can I do that? I you would know? hope so. Yeah. I, I mean, do you think? Um, so just not, and I, I don't think either one of us are diehard off-road guys. Like we've been off-road, but like the desert is not really our thing. Would yeah, that I mean, be safe like, to say? 
I'll be the first to admit that I may or may not have listened to some Caius and some Bram York out in the desert while, okay. you know, <laughs> maybe having a little bit of a vision quest of my own. I guess that's prob that's possible. Okay. But okay. did you dream, did you vision at that moment ripping across the desert at 118 miles an hour in a supercharged 700 horsepower pickup truck? No, I would have to say that I, if anything, I probably dreamed or envisioned myself floating above the desert in some sort of magical <laughs> okay. mystical way right so if i'm doing if i'm if i'm all now looking at earthly pursuits like rip ass and across the desert in that t-rex yeah i'm down for that right plus oh, i'm 50. okay that's the version that's my version of vision quest these days just give me a, a yeah. just give me a t-rex 700 plus horsepower uh, 118 miles an hour and put, let me put the air conditioner on right I, let me do this yeah. with ac blasting yeah i feel like that's i think at our age that's kind of the key right yeah fast right. comfortable air conditioned right done okay. i still so, i still want to see brant bjork in one of these things though i think that's a great commercial <laughs> if you're listening dodge uh if you're listening tim i want to see brant bjork doing the basically doing the uh the sound design for the next commercial for the t-rex how's that sound? there you go <laughs> so all right so on on just press alone are we giving this a barbecue thumbs up or oh, a barbecue maybe or i think Two barbecue thumbs up, two okay. greasy pork stained thumbs yep. up, right? I agree. One's probably agree. wrapped around a beer. I think that's probably yeah. fair too. You know, this is 700 horsepower. It better be wrapped around a beer. That's macho. Right. Don't you think? I think I, so. Yeah. In, the, in the bed of a T Rex, right? With a tailgate down. Well, yeah. Well, now, okay. So then, then the next step is, is Hemmings needs a press T Rex. Guys at Ram, if you're listening, right. give us a T Rex. Dan and I. Good we'll point. properly abuse it in the desert and we will That's give right. you a full review that yeah. I'm sure will be glowing because why wouldn't it be? It's got 700 horsepower and it's eight inches wider than a standard Ram, which is pretty cool. We may um, even be able to locate a, a, a Hemi powered drag boat to pull behind it. We may or may not be able to locate one of those. So we might. I think that. we know where one sits. It's upping the ante a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So moving on from that right we, we've got the pickup trucks i want to we want to kind of get through this beginning section really quick because we've got again alana sure on the show who's amazing um but i know one of the things that we've talked about dan and i have talked about talked about this offline is our lack of doing events and i don't just mean big events like sema or things like that but just the standard gathering with your buddies and cars and coffee like that. Right, so right. it is driving me insane. Dan, how is it, how has it kind of affected you with all this I, stuff? I, Rona summer is finally getting to me. Like I'm trying to be an adult about this, you know, I'm trying yeah. to, I'm trying to act responsibly. Uh, you know, my wife is now has been making uh, custom masks for the past six months, but yep. we're both kind of over it. I'm sure we all are. Right. Yeah. I think at the same time, it's hard to see car events taking place right now with a whole bunch of people all crammed together, like as if yeah. nothing's happening, because I think that's going to extend this Rona summer into the Rona fall and the Rona winter and maybe the Rona New Year's Eve. And I'd hate yeah. to actually see that, but I think that's coming. So, yeah, I mean, with the announcement that SEMA was canceled this year and, um, you know, that 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 seemed to set the tone for the rest of the year that we've already been seeing. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we're all looking forward to, I mean, you know, we're even skipping our, we're even skipping birthdays this year. We're just going to like put this year yeah. off all together. And next year we're just going to do a reset, a level reset. Yeah. What do you think? I, um, I feel like that's, that's pretty on point. Right. I know yeah. all the cars and coffee events that like, and there have been a couple and it, what I'm finding is it's interesting when you, when you talk to, I've been to, like one high end cars and coffee that was just like Porsches and Ferraris and stuff like that, right. which is not really my wheelhouse, but it was an event. So I kind of went everyone at that event was wearing masks. Yeah. Then I went to a muscle car event. No one at that event was wearing any right. type of mask except for me. And I was like, <laughs> so do y'all not like, do you is know this, what's happening? Do you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. You know, do you understand? Do you, do you not care? Is it not? Like, care? Yeah. <laughs> Am I the crazy one? Right. Oh, oh, believe me. Yeah. No, but, that's true. Yeah, dude. It's the it's only thing I can me. say. Yeah, the only thing I can say that you know, the only benefit to all this is that, uh, you know, the the it gives me more time to actually finish building the hot rod than yeah. I would have had. You know, had this been the non-Rona summer, 
you know so there, sure. if there's any if there's any silver lining to this it's that's giving me more time and more of an excuse to actually like you know get more stuff done right inside so projects. The yeah right yeah. you know yeah yep i i and, absolutely do agree with that and by the way i was ordering uh i was ordering some fasteners last night and the by by the sheer fact that i cannot get a uh an allen head um socket uh bolt a three-quarter inch socket bolt in under two weeks has yeah. from summit now summit as you know is one yeah, of those companies that if overnight you even, right if you, th- you know if you're thinking about ordering something something will show up on your doorstep within an hour <laughs> right. right that's usually right. the way that works this yeah. two weeks two weeks to get some nuts and bolts that's got to mean that guys are out there people are out there building stuff right this yeah. year right i would imagine well, it's kind of so then so i guess then i guess what we're both hoping is that for 2021 we're going to see some amazing shit pop out of the woodwork Man, we hope right that hope. was built you know this COVID approved built in 2020 for 2021 boom right so. right i'm i'm fully expecting to see david bowie's spaceship actually materialize you know fully customed out with a uh you know with a, a full lime green metal flake paint job that's what i'm expecting ah. to see coming out of this this okay this is a good segue so Ooh, speaking of yeah. This I think I'm gonna yeah this is this is good so Just, as, as we do there? on see what I did it was, there? Very, it was very smooth it was very kind of incognito I'm glad you like that so as we do we're gonna do this every episode so Dan and I we take a turn and we pick one of the cars that we fall in love with that are that's listed in the Hemmings classified now for those of you that don't know we've got twenty five thirty thousand cars listed in the classifieds everything from hell you could find a a Stanley steamer in there all the way up to a Lamborghini. You could find everything. Um, So Dan, what, what is your car? What are we going to look at today? And then next week, next week is me. I get Yeah, next week is you. Yeah. This, this week, uh, I was absolutely stopped in my tracks over a 20, a 1923 Ford model T roadster pickup truck. Now I say that I combine all those words into one long strung out sentence simply because there Ooh. actually is this hot rod out there that uh, somebody built, and it is lime green metal flake, and it is absolutely a classic tea bucket hot rod, right? Yeah, and one of the things we were talking about in inside Hemmings here was this idea of having a couple conversations with wow. some young guys who are into like choppers and motorcycles. We talk a lot internally about like how do we make the connection between the chopper scene that's white hot and has been for a right. couple of years and move people into the car scene? How do we do that? And one of the ways that was uh, brought up to me this past week by a builder buddy, and we're going to get more into this later down the road, um, is that he kind of made the statement that that tea buckets that tea mm-hmm. bucket hot rod style from the late 60s and early 70s is really just a chopper on four wheels and that they're the same type of work and the same types of talent it takes to build a chopper you could easily translate that into a tea bucket hot rod because you basically can start with a frame on laying on the floor yep. and you, you find a motor you find four wheels and four different tires and you find like a body and yeah. you can actually build something from a bare floor much in the way you can do with a chopper and it's yeah. light and it's small and the motors are easy to get to because they're all exposed and you can change headers if you want and you can change tail lights and put whatever you want yeah. on it and i thought that was a pretty interesting observation right well it is because i mean when you think about any type of motorcycle any type of ch- especially choppers especially obviously right they're they're such an extension of the owner's personality right That's you right. as soon as you see one you just and, and if you know the owner you're like Oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, for him or for right, her. right, right. So I think that in a chopper is the same thing, right? Because yeah. I know, like I know, I look at your car. When I look at the Stoner T, I'm like the only person in the world that could have come up with that was Dan. Dumb enough to drive something like that. Is, to crazy yeah. enough to do that. But it, it's <laughs> such an extension of and and for those of you like you obviously get to know Dan, but it's such an extension of his personality. And the more you talk to him you look at the little nuances of the car and you're like, oh, that's, well, Dan did this. And it makes perfect sense yeah, where, right. you know, so a lot of these other cars, just like motorcycles, are the same thing, right? Right. It's and there's that, even a translation. You, you, and you can even translate even like front wheel, like front wheels. Hallcraft was a company that made laced or spoked wheels back in the 60s. And they're used on motorcycles. 
and they're actually mm-hmm. used on tea buckets as well. No front yeah. brakes. Right. Like skinny 18 inch, like 18 by three and a half or 18 inch by four inch yeah. wide, you know, laced wheels. Um, yep. They could be the same on a, on, you know, on a, on a tea bucket as they could be on a chopper. So some really neat crossover, you know, yeah. parts, custom parts there too, that yeah, pretty neat. So let me ask you about the one that you found, because I'm yeah. looking at the photo of him. We're obviously have some photos up here. Right. So it's, it really, I mean, it's a tea bucket pickup. It's cool as hell. Got the external gas tank back in the bed. Yeah. The windshield on that seems yes. abnormally large. Yeah, that was or a, was, was that was, was that the way that it would have been when it was stock? Yeah, like, was it a, that big? That's a classic T bucket move right there. That's a classic T bucket style. A stock height Model T windshield. That's what you're looking at right there. A lot of okay. them were two pieces. Um, yeah. this one, you know, you can, you can modify those things and make them into one piece too. Yep. Uh, Touring's had, I think, uh, two piece windshields, if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, that okay. tall T or that, that tall stock height windshield is very indicative of the T bucket craze. And that was literally just everything else is cut down. Um, everything else is highly modified. Everything else is hot rotted, but those windshields yep. are just big giant sails right like and, okay. and you sit yeah. behind those and that's really the only protection you've got from the outside elements is just that big giant pane of glass yeah you know it, so it, it looks yeah. cool and that the, cool? the other thing the hood ornament it the, the I, if you guys see in the picture the oh, hood yeah. ornament is this like it's a pissed off cockatoo yeah like it's with this and it's you know there was like remember the rubber ducky hood ornament from oh, yeah. back in the day right like this is reminiscent of that Except it's just a cockatoo and not a duck, but it's pretty right, right. badass. It's and then cool. little nuances, the eyeball in there and the yeah, it almost looks like a teak floor interior with a footwell that's literally that big. Right. Right. You know, it's just the coolest, man. And yeah, like that. I've never seen a pissed off cockatoo, you know, hood ornament. I don't know where I'd love to know where he got that thing. That's yeah. worth that's no. worth buying this thing alone, right? Just for that. Dude, this was a good find. <laughs> yeah, this was thought- a very I thought people yeah. would like seeing that because that's something that, you know, if you know Hemmings and, and you know uh, what Hemmings is, is usually known for like posting in the classifieds, this is gr- a great example of just how deep those class, you know, someone told me one time, an old um, colleague of ours at Hemmings said one time that he estimated that between all the parts and cars and services and everything else that even real estate that you can yeah. find on Hemmings and in our marketplace that anyone at any one moment, there's about a billion with a B dollars worth of stuff for sale on Hemmings. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that's that a bit ridiculous. I, I, I'm just blown away. The, by yeah. It. Well, and that, that that's one of the problems with working for, you know, with Hemmings and working at Hemmings is that we have access to all of this stuff. You and want everything. It's, it, it's a yeah. very difficult thing to just not spend your money because, yeah, <laughs> right. you know, that's Dan right. and I'll send each other stuff back and forth and it, it's just a never ending story. Did but... you see? Did you see? Did you see? Yeah. You know, like, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, but listen, that's that's one of the best parts about being here. But that's guys, right. we're going to take a five second break, 10 second break, and then we're going to come back with Alana Schur, um, who journalist does video podcasting, everything. One of my favorite yeah, journalists in the world. She's um, so awesome. She's amazing. Stay tuned. We'll be back in five seconds. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. I am Mike Musto along with Mr. Dan Stoner. Yep, yep. Here I am. And our wonderful and amazing and one of my favorite people on this whole earth, journalist, personality, superwoman extraordinaire, Alana Scher. And soon to be doing? mine. Soon to be mine. I <laughs> we, we've all, only gotten to meet her once before at SEMA at the, at uh, the, the best. SEMA show. So this is great. Yeah. Oh gosh, I like this. Let's yeah. keep going. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so how are you doing? I'm good. You know, I mean, I feel like that kind of question is a little fraught in 2020. How are you yeah. doing? Right. I'm fine. I right. I'm fine. I am working. My family is healthy. Everything's good. And actually, we've got some pretty fun projects. So I would say that I'm luckier than some. Alana, would you say that you're kind of like uh, Tom Selleck in that episode of Friends where, you know, he's, you know, he's just divorced and they ask him how he's doing. He's like, I'm fine. And you kind of have to shake your head like, <laughs> I'm fine. You know, that comes along with it, right? 
<laughs> no, I feel guilty because I'm not like that because I'm like actually fine. Like oh. I, I, feel, I feel like I should be doing worse. I feel like there are so many people doing worse and I'm like, actually I'm having a pretty, pretty fun year. It's a little like, lonely, but. Like actual yeah. resolute fineness. That's yeah. Right. I'm getting stuff done. That's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good. That's inspiring I mean, actually. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, we've all been in the house or in our, where our domiciles are doing what we do. And the thing that I think we miss the most is just the interaction with everybody, <laughs> right? It's just, you yeah. know, I mean, yes, we could do this and we could talk to people and, and stuff, but it's it's just not the same as going to an event or talking in person or anything like that. So, yeah. Right. But right. are you guys doing okay? Yeah. Okay. So far, so good. You know, like we were talking about just before we went on air, you know, there's to, to memify the conversation right off uh, the bat, you know, it's like uh, we're all Gen X and, you know, we were kind of built for this, you know, this, this, yeah. this social isolation, the original latchkey kids, like I was saying, where we were like, you know, we had to figure out how to fend for ourselves and make a pizza and ride our BMX bikes and, you know, <laughs> somehow get to the ET showing on Friday yeah. night by ourselves, that's, right? Like right. we're built for this. We know how to that's, do it. That's very, very true. <laughs> so Alana, so let's, I wanted to, I wanted to have you on the podcast because I, I wanted to tell the story of Alana Show. I wanted everybody to know how you got started in this business, what you did be before. I know. Well, you have to say with that kind of inflection. It gets, it, 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 Dan, it brings people in. This oh is what guy. It sucks them in. It's like the midnight storm with Alana Show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like, that's we're, we're trying this. We're new at this. We're trying to build this up. So, we've right. got to take every liberty we can. Yeah. So, okay. So no pressure. How, no pressure. Well, not on us. The pressure's on Alana. Yeah, the, it's on Alana. Okay. Yeah, it's on Alana. I'm, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So let's start from the beginning. How did you? How did you start with it? What What did you do before this? And then how did you decide that I want to be an automotive journalist and get into writing and and so on and so forth? Um. Okay. So I don't know how far back you want to go. Um, I did not grow up in a car family. In fact, I, I just got off the phone with um, Carolyn Cassini, who does, who works um, up in San Francisco and does uh, all sorts of cool car stuff. And she was saying that, you know, she knew she wanted to be a car woman since she was like okay. five years old. She like has a story from being eight years old. That's like, I wanted to do car stuff. Um, I was not like that. My mom had an old car because mm -hmm. we had an old car. It was not cool. <laughs> Nobody else's mom had such an old car. And uh, and there was nothing about my childhood as I remember it that would have led me to say, like, I'm going to do car stuff later. I mean, I w was like, you know, what, what was like a little like a wannabe horse girl. I wanted to have a horse, you know, I, okay. I was I drew a lot. I read a lot. Um, okay. Spent a lot of time outside. I wanted to be a veterinarian, that kind of thing. I mean, it was very. um very sort of classic. Was there a Dorothy? Uh, was there a Dorothy Hamill fa phase that you went through at all? No, I wasn't no? even. A, I wasn't even what you would have called a tomboy back then. Um, I mean, I wasn't a girly girl either. I just it, it, there wasn't. It wasn't like oh wow, well she's really sporty and like it makes sense right. that she likes boy stuff or whatever. I mean, I liked. I had dolls. I had a lot of toy animals. I was really into animals. That was basically like the kid. We kid never would have guessed that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so weird. Yeah. <laughs> but I did, I did read a lot and I really liked writing even back then. Um, okay. but when I went to school, I went to school for art. Um, I went to high uh -huh. school for music actually. And then I went to college for fine art. Um, and I took a lot of English and history classes there, but I wanted to be a gallery artist, you know, like, Oh, no way. Yeah. Like I wanted to like have shows and sell art and like dress up and go to parties where there's free wine, which I did end up getting to do, but not, Ooh, okay. not through art. That, sound, um, that sounds marvelous, by the way. Can we just go do yeah. that? Can we just, it's not for too late, right? Nobody does that anymore. Um, so, you know, I went, I went all the way through school and I really liked it. And I had incredible teachers there. And I, at that point, I still did not have a driver's license. So I was like okay. tw 20 and I didn't have a driver's license, didn't know how to drive a car. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. I, I just, I wasn't into it. But I was starting to get into it mostly because okay. uh, all of my friends who would pick me up and take me places were like, yeah, yeah you're fun, but you're not that fun. Like, <laughs> mm. you know, like you if need, it's you on need the to, way. 
<laughs> you now, need to Lana, figure out your own trans. In LA? Where, where did you grow up? Like what part of this was it out in Los Angeles? Yeah, this was in Los Angeles. Really? Um, like in the yeah. valley or like LA? I mean, because it takes a while. I mean, to not drive <laughs> in LA. In LA. Right? That's saying something. Yeah, it was a thing. Um, I mean, it, you know, Altadena, then I lived on the west side, then I lived in Hollywood. Um, so yeah, I know I don't I don't anymore, but I used to know the buses extremely well. But it was a great way of learning the city. So if you ever move to a new place, I do recommend like a week of public transportation and mm -hmm. you'll get to, you'll know it way better than if you try and drive around. Yeah. Um so there I am. I'm starting to not get to go to parties because <laughs> you don't have a car. Nobody's right. gonna pick me up. Right. Right. And uh and so I decided I want to get a car. And as we were talking, Dan aesthetic choices i'm like i want an old car yeah. old cars look cooler new cars yes, look do. like jelly beans right so, and you're in la right and i'm you in have, la you have to. right it matters and you and saw swingers like you saw swingers like <laughs> totally you know, i mean that, right? that's yeah. the time period right. right so a friend of mine was very into um i can hear it echo can you guys hear it no we're no fine. okay no nope, you're Sorry good about that. You're good. <laughs> all right you're good um so a friend of mine was really into classic cars and he was specifically into Chrysler products. So he had, I think a 73 charger at the time. Okay. Um, and then he had a four door Polara green. Mm, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, we'd hang out a lot cause we lived right next to each other. So like he'd give me rides places. We went on road trips together and worked yeah. on his car and it was really fun. We used to like meet up on Sundays and like watch NASCAR and then NHRA yeah. and then, you know, drink beer all night. So um, I'm like, okay, cars are kind of fun. Car, car stuff's kind of cool. And he's like, well, I'll help you right. buy a car. Cause I mean, I couldn't even test drive stuff. Like I right. literally did not know how to drive. Like you had no idea how to drive a car. Yeah. I mean like a bicycle was the fastest like movement that I had ever been in charge yeah, yeah. of. Right. So. Which is faster than the city bus in LA. I'm sure too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Well, and also very not in charge of the bus. <laughs> right. um, so Damon and I started getting the recycler and um, we'd, we'd look at cars and he'd be like, how about this one? How about that one? Yeah. And then we'd, if it looked like a good one, we'd go and check it out. He'd drive it and I'd look at it. We'd talk to the owner and on the way back, sure. he'd be like, well, what did you think of that one? This and that. Yeah. And uh, eventually I ended up buying a 73 Plymouth Duster. And it was- nice. That was your first car? <laughs> that nice. was my first car. That's outstanding. Um, it was, it was a sweet little car. It was triple white. So okay. white vinyl top, white bucket seats interior, and the fold down seat in the back, and a white exterior. Small block car. Um, wow. Okay. Now, what, year, what year was this? Uh, around two thousand. Okay, and the reason I'm asking is because, and and I and sorry for interrupting, but I had to ask this. In that period of time, is it your is it your interpretation of the entire Mopar scene that that was also more of the punk rock scene? Would you equate those two? Uh, um, I certainly would not disagree with you on it. Um, uh, I didn't know the the rest of the car scene, so I can't totally compare it. Compare but there was it. definitely like a kind of a kind of punk, uh, like maybe punk rockabilly edge yes. to it. Um, right. And then this, the friend who helped me actually was a noise musician. So yeah, we went to a lot of okay. um, we that went to a lot sense. of shows in those cars. But uh, so he helped me buy that duster and, you know, immediately, I think the, um, I think the starter went out. It was the very okay. first thing. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. Right, right on schedule, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I, I didn't have a garage or anything. So I remember pulling it up on the, on the curb outside of yep. my apartment and like working on it. And I remember my neighbor in the apartment came down and helped me because I, I was missing a bolt or something. And he so like- So did you do it? Happened when... did you, yeah, you I did. like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I, I can do this. I can do this with the with the book. There's instructions. Yeah. And uh, you know, and I'd, and I'd also done some stuff. Like I'd already been working on cars with Damien. Okay. So I like, I, I wasn't afraid of that part of it. I thought it was cool. Right. And so it was kind of like that for a year. I, I finally got my license. There was a lot of like small things and drove that car for a while. And then I got rear-ended. And Ooh, hmm. um, while it was in the paint shop, I bought a 72 Dodge Challenger um, <laughs> that I found wow. like on the streets in Silver Lake with like a for sale sign on it. And, and w what did you pay for it? A thousand bucks. Wow. That's amazing to me. And that's a wow. that was a running and driving Challenger. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, 
it needed work, although by today's standards, not bad. It wasn't rusty at all. It, it had some body damage and a terrible paint job, and it was a six-cylinder car. But um, still, yeah. yeah. So then I drove that car for a while, and I was like, I want to put a, a big block in this because everyone, all my cool car friends, you know, they were doing car engine swaps. Of course. So I bought I bought an engine off of Craigslist. Um, actually, uh, Don Bowles from the Germs. I don't know. If okay. You, yeah. You know sure. That band. But uh, Don Bowles took me in his uh, A100 van to go pick oh, up the engine. <laughs> that's a whole story. Now, did he live in Silver Lake? Please tell me he lived in Silver Lake. At the um, I think he might have lived downtown. Oh, okay. That makes more yeah. sense. I mean, that makes me feel better. That 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 would have made my heart hurt if I knew that, you know, Don <laughs> from the germs was living in Silver Lake. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's hard for me to remember exactly. I, I always saw him downtown because that's where the music scene was. But I think he... Yeah. He either lived there or he might have lived like all the way down in like Long Beach or San Pedro or something. Oh, wow. Um, he did not live in Silver Lake. So you're so good. then, yeah. What good. engine did you buy? Did you get like a, a 383 or 440 or? I got a 440, Mike. There is only Beautiful. one engine. <laughs> that's true. Um, There's only one. You know, off a of Craigslist of yeah. all things, right? That's well, great. I think you it was out of a Newport. Then, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so I mean, this you... was, this would be what, 2002, 2001 around that time? Yeah, around 2002, I think probably. Okay. Um, okay. And so I, I was like, I can do this and started, you know, I took stuff apart. I got stuff to the, to the machine. It's like the basic stuff. And I ordered yeah. parts and, you know, and I was asking people's advice. I don't want to pretend that I was like, sure. I'm so good at this. I did it all by myself. Like I, I yeah. asked people around like, Oh, what do you think for cam and yeah. this and that? So then I get all the parts back They're on an engine stand in my living room because you know, no garage. Right. Right. And, right. Um, Cause you live in the dream. Exactly. And I look at everything and I look at the exploded diagrams in the book and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is not, this is not going <laughs> to no. happen. I, I, I might have, this. might have overestimated my ability here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so at that point I, I asked for some help and, um, my friend who was a mechanic was like, well, why don't you talk to this guy, Tom, you've met him before at the car shows. He's a yeah. nice guy. He knows how to build engines. And he works, his day job is down the street from you. So, right. you know, I like think, oh, everyone's doing this for fun. So I'm like, hey, dude, I'll get you some beer and pizza if you help me put this engine together. Dude, the dude's a professional engine builder. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like. <laughs> beer and pizza. That's all he needs. And, and he, said, he said yes, though. Um, because I guess. And, and, look, what, and look what ended yeah. up happening. Right. I married him. Uh, you married him. So like, that's yeah. <laughs> Beer, pizza. And no, a big block. Engine swap marriage yeah mm -hmm. that's amazing mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah. i mean there was you know there was a, a little bit of time in between something, okay, between something the marriage, but, okay. but we're hitting um, the major points right there right yeah right yeah. i'm trying to i'm trying to go fast <laughs> right. um <laughs> so anyway after i did the engine swap i drove that car a ton i love that challenger it was just okay. it was it was so like you want to talk punk rock that car was so punk rock it was like flat black i, I remember oh, i drew yeah. like a skull and crossbones on the door with that's like so white, good like, that's so awesome. just like, and I um and I learned how to drag race in that car and uh, and got I mean we got it pretty fast I think at, by the time we had a nitrous kit on it it was running in the twelves which at the time that's, was extremely fast for some I mean that's still frightening fast. that's frighteningly fast for that I mean, car right yeah. well listen we, we live in a time where everything is is quick but listen a twelve second car today is still a fast car it's still a fast car yeah. You know, yeah, what, I, it's, it's what I have seen, what I have seen that car in the old Gearhead magazine, because that sounds like it's right mm -hmm. in there. You might you know, have Mike um, Lavella and Gearhead. Yeah, I bet yeah, so, he must have known about you. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if he paid that much attention to me, but I, I, I knew Alan Rudder and uh, yep, I know and, Alan. Sure. And Mike were friends, yep. and um, and the San Francisco gang in general. Yeah. I think it was like Harvey and Matt and. Anyway, yeah. we'll talk about that some we'll other time. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah. right. Nobody yeah. listening to this is going to care that, that's about That's over beer. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this <laughs> thing going over your high school yearbook. And this girl, yeah, right. you know, like, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, do you remember her? She was nice. Remember, yeah, anyway. that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got, you know, I got really into drag racing. I got more into cars. I got into the car community, as we're, yeah. as we're talking about. And I also started reading a lot of car magazines. Um, okay. You know, that was sort of how I was learning a lot of this stuff, because at first when I would pick them up, I would just be like, okay, these pictures are nice. And then eventually yeah. the words started to mean something as I, as I lived it a little more. And 
at that point, I was like, it would be really fun to write for a car magazine. Yeah. So that's probably 2003 or something. I was like, that okay. would be really fun to write for a car magazine. And I started. So who, who, who influenced you early on? So when you started writing or when you started reading the magazines and what I did, are, were there certain people that stuck out in your head? Like, oh, I, I really like her writing or I really like his writing. Um, well, there were no her writings, at least not in the magazines that I was reading. <laughs> okay. Um, I think Jean Jennings was writing, but I wasn't reading Automobile. Um, okay. I, you know, I mean, it'll sound like pandering, but um, I liked Freiburger a lot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I really liked Carcraft, which mm -hmm. at the time I think was Jeff Smith and Doug yeah. Glad and John McGann. Um, but I think I don't remember who was in charge, but I remember it was very funny. Actually, Freiburger yeah. might have been in charge of Carcraft. I think that yeah, time. David was doing yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, because they that... would do these like hot or not lists and stuff, and it would be like, yeah. it would be like. Oh, that's something for me to look up. Like I don't, you know, I, like I, yeah. I very much remember it was like, like, um, or in and out. It was like one was a uh, was having a parachute on a car and not needing it was out, and needing a parachute on a car and not having it was in. And I just right. like I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I mean, still still holds up, right? Yeah, I mean, right. it still holds up. It yeah. does. Um, <laughs> So then so, when did you start yeah. to say, okay, I want to do this as a career. And then what, what was it like when you first started writing? Like do you, what was your first published piece? Well, I started applying right away and like just crickets, like nobody, nobody wanted me to do any work. And I think I might've, I first published piece might've just been like a photo in gearhead or something like that, helping right. Bumbeck or somebody shoot a shoot a car, but sure. um, the first piece that I had that was actually published, although not paid, was in Mopar Collector's Guide. Oh wow! Um, okay, and it was it was about a drag race between my Challenger and um, and a guy in an Evo. Um, okay. At, at the time, the Evo was running a 13, 12 second. Yeah like quarter mile time and they were a big deal. Like the Subarus and the Evos were like 2006, deal. seven around yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and so that, I think that was my very first published. Who won? Yeah. Who won? That? I just, I just checking. I just, come just, on. Just, just checking. <laughs> but I was worried about it. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. So then after, so then that came out and then did you say, okay, well, did you always want to write about classic stuff or you know, as, as opposed to kind of going higher end or that's where you just kind of fell into it because of, of what your, what you liked, right. Aesthetically and yeah. mechanically and things like that. Okay. Uh, oh, my, my world was totally muscle cars. Like, okay. Like totally. It, I mean, back then it wasn't even like all muscle cars. It was like Mopar muscle cars. Like I had, you know, I was still, Very specific. there was still a lot for me to just learn in that group. And, and I had right. no, you know, I had no interest really in anything else. Um, okay. So at the time, did you, when you were looking around, because, you know, especially in the gearhead community, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> you know, there's like, like I was saying earlier, like Mopar is kind of like, that's the, you know, those guys were probably like the same guys who were going to like Comic-Con, you know, at the same, at the time, right? Like you kind <laughs> of make that connection, right? Yeah. And, like, there's, and then there's the Chevy crowd and the Ford guys, you know, and, um, did you think at any point that like, you know, you just happened to buy that first car and it just so happened that that was kind of like spiritually where you made your <laughs> anyway, it was just kind of lucky that way. Or what did you think at some point, Hey, you know, Camaro would be cool, but eh, I got the challenger. Like, was there yeah. any kind of thoughts like that when you were going? Cause you kind of identify with <laughs> the kind of car you got, right? Yeah. Well, okay, to be. Um, to be totally honest, when I first started looking, I wanted a Nova, like at the very, very yeah. beginning. Uh, like a Fox Nova. Nova or like an early 70s? Oh, all comes out. No, like an early 70s Nova. Oh, you and, did? Okay. Yeah. And the, so my friend Damien, the one who was helping me, was like, I have no interest in Chevrolets. We're only looking at Chryslers. Why don't you look at this Duster? Yeah. Because uh, it's the same shape. Kind of, kind of, you know? Yeah. Nova equivalent. Same, same yeah. thing. I didn't want a huge car. We, we test drove. I remember we test drove a 73 satellite, which was pretty right. badass. Yeah. Um, and we drove an earlier 60s satellite, but I was like, oh, they're really big, you know, yeah. <laughs> first car problems. Like I, yeah. it is better to have a small car as a first car, sure. I think. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so I think it's a mix of, of being lucky that way. And also just 
there was like I had the friends almost before I had the car. Right. And it was just it just so happened that they were car people. So then and I they, met more car people, but it was like always um it was always a similar kind of deal. I mean, I met a lot of people who were into music and who were into art and who were younger right. and stuff. So I never had that experience that I think some people have with cars where they kind of have to go into it and be like, well, I don't have anything else in common with these yeah. folks that we like cars. Like, I mean, these were people I was hanging out with anyway. Right. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because like the way I kind of see this stuff too, and I think there's a lot of evidence to prove this. As soon as you said like, well, music and art and, you know, culture, stuff, like Mopar. You know, like that's kind of how that works. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's kind of how yeah. that works. <laughs> so, which is glorious, right, you, by the way. You 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 were in Mopar Collective's Guide, right? You wrote your piece there. So, how did you move on from there? And was you know, did you get any feedback from the um, from the editor or the you know readers or anything like that? Or did it pretty much go unnoticed? And then you were like, well, the hell with this. I'm just going to keep moving forward until somebody says something. I mean. I I didn't even know it got published until we got the magazine, you know, it was like, Oh, wow. Okay. You know, Cause like I said, I didn't, you know, I didn't get paid for it or right. um, I'm not even totally sure it had a byline on it. Um, but uh, yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, there was like nothing in that direction after that. I was, I think at the time I was working at, at a mo motorcycle racing shop, um, okay. like working in the back, like packaging things and doing right. mail order. Um, and then I did some uh, carbon fiber work at, an, at another motorcycle racing shop. So I learned a lot okay. there about motorsports and about marketing. And, and then I moved into PR. Um, and so the PR yeah. was, was close to writing. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, and I was, I was getting to talk to the people at the magazines. But yeah, I still wasn't, I still didn't. I didn't have any idea how to move forward from that. Like I, I kept applying when I would see jobs for that, but I mean, there weren't very many jobs open, you know. Right. And like at that point, if you, oops, I just turned the volume down. Um, at that point, you, if you weren't looking at the magazine itself, there was no other way of knowing what they were doing. Right. You know, they were they weren't running social media. Right. Sure. They well, barely really had websites. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was still a print-driven magazine kind of world, right? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And so, like, every once in a while in in the, the editor's uh, editorial or maybe, like, in, the in like, a little blurb at the very front, they'd be like, we're, we're hiring. Um, but they never hired me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, you know, whatever. I don't know. Like, I don't know if this would ever happen. So I just kept, you know, I was doing the – doing PR and yep. – um, and I learned a lot and I'm not sorry that I did it. Although I recently wrote a press release for a friend and I was like, Oh my God, it's so hard. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but uh, the thankless job. Yeah. Right? So really like how right? the PR person work hard, but um, eventually I did find out that hot rod was hiring and okay. um, because I had, a, I had friends who worked there and they told me the hot rod was hiring and they had an open position for like six months. I didn't apply. I just, I knew that it was there. Right. And finally, I think I was there at the offices for, for some PR related thing. And I walked by David Freiberger's office and I said, Hey, would it be weird if I applied for your open job? And he's like, uh, I've been waiting for you to do that. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Nice. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and he hired me, you know, and it's still like, it's still like a life changing moment, you know? So that's amazing. So, okay. So now, so you walk by Freiburger's desk, pop your head in. Yes. I want to hire you. Boom. Now you're hired. Now you're on staff and you're working at hot rod magazine, which is like the pinnacle of the, the, the motorsport or the hot rod scene. Right. I mean, I know for me, I mean, I, we both written for hot rod and it's still, some, I mean, it's the coolest feeling ever. Like, what do you do? I write for Hot Rod Magazine. Like, it's the best <laughs> thing in the world. It's it's fantastic. So what was that like? And how did, you know, how did that change your whole attitude towards car culture in general? And then, you know, as a woman, how did the, how was the reception when you started getting published? Um, It's, you know, it was, it was really, really a magical experience going 
going over there. I mean, the team was great. They were all, everyone who was on staff there was so nice and so interesting and so into cars. Yep. And I learned, I felt like, I felt like I was in, a, in an accelerated learning course in, in sure. college because I'd already expanded a lot just doing PR. Like I already had yeah. to learn a whole, whole lot about, you know, other muscle cars. Um, yep. But I still, I still really was mostly muscle car knowledge. Like, so right. learning all of the hot rod history, the actual hot rod history, you know, that was just, it was super cool. And, and Tom Taylor worked at Hot Rod at that time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm getting to learn from a guy who, who really knows it, who's been a part yeah. of it. Um, and Hot Rod is so well respected that if I called someone, you know, whether they were a racer or a builder yeah. or something, and I was like, tell me about this, they would, you know, yeah. like they were excited to do it. And so that was, it was just incredible. I just felt like every day I learned something really interesting. I learned a new interesting story. Yep. Um, like, I don't know what the opposite of jaded is, <laughs> diamond did, but it was <laughs> like, that's how I felt. Like, I just felt like every day was going to be so interesting and it, and it really yeah. was. Um, and, you know, and from Hot Rod, I went and did Roadkill for, yep. for David. Um, sure. You know, he sort of, he put me in charge of, of, they had a magazine and a website. And so that was super fun because, you know, Hot Rod was amazing, but it was snobby. You know, even, <laughs> even. That's so un weird. <laughs> even under Freiberger and Kennedy, who, who expanded its yeah. definition considerably over, over what it used to be. Because like I said, I was a Carcraft fan. Cause I right. felt like hot rod in the early two thousands was a little bit like too upscale for me. Right. Um, but then getting to go to roadkill where all of a sudden it was like, it doesn't have to be an American car. It doesn't have to be a fast car. It doesn't have to be a right. pretty car. Like it doesn't have to be any of the things that, that a hot rod, that a car had to be for hot rod. Sure. It was like really, really fun. I remember very early in the roadkill thing I was doing. Um, it was still when we were doing Facebook live. And I was doing a Facebook live at a show and someone in the comments was like, I know you came from hot rod because you always walk past all the imports. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, called out. <laughs> and so then I started, you know, making like a really more conscious effort to be like, what would I normally walk past? And I'm going to walk up to it right. and find out about it instead. Um, right. and it was great. It was so awesome. I mean, again, it was that same feeling of being like every day I can learn something new because there's so much out there. Isn't it great when the audience calls you out? Because I the audience is amazing for for the fact that they tell you exactly how bad you suck <laughs> and exactly <laughs> what you need to do to please them. They are not shy about that. Um, yeah. I I mean I you had asked earlier what it was like to be a woman at Hot Rod or and yeah. I would say that I was expecting much worse. It was actually okay. it was actually very trauma free. Um Good. Again, the okay. staff the staff was great, so I had no problems at all with who I worked with. And then the readers are actually really good too. I think maybe every once in a while, I think maybe there's only one or two, like specifically targeted to me things about like, hey, a woman shouldn't be doing this. Um, when we would started doing video and online stuff, that was a little bit harder because okay. like, I mean that was the true trash fire internet, you know, before oh, people yeah. start, started like kind of making each other be a little more polite in the comments. So, I mean, the comments yeah. were gross. Yeah. If there was a woman in a video, they were gross. Like whether it was me or someone else, it didn't matter. Right. Um, you know, they were just, they were gross in on like every angle of grossness yeah. and meanness and it was upsetting, but um, you know, and I don't think that anyone should have to develop a thick skin in order to do this. Yeah. But I did, and it helped, you know, I mean, it helped a lot. I yeah. hope that going forward, someone who is in that position won't ever have to read the kind of stuff that, you know, that, that people like. Yeah. Do. Oh, yeah. Well. I mean, I, and that dumpster fire is still sort of smoldering, right? Like, there's still <laughs> yeah, some of that out there, but we are bleeding well, ourselves better, I think. I know when I started in video, the comments that I would get. And I would have instances where like my mom would read a comment and she would call me and she would be like, what did Ohio 678, why did he call you that? Or if, is that, who is that? You know, I want to know. I'm like, mom, it's, I'm in my forties. It's totally yeah, fine. fine. Yeah. You know? Um, but as a woman, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I've read some of the stuff and you know, it, 
it doesn't matter where it's coming from or who is saying it. When somebody criticizes you on a personal level, whether it's the way you look or the way you act or what you sound like, it you know, it's a shot. You know, and yeah. you like, don't really smell like right. that. You're like, that's not very nice to say to me. Like, <laughs> I was just trying to make, you know. Yeah, you yeah. You don't know my mama, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. She's a great lady. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that stuff is really hard. I think the kind of people who say it, for the most part, don't even realize how that it could be hurtful. You know, like, right. I think they feel, I think they feel powerless and weak and jealous. And so, they want to snipe at you and but it doesn't occur to them that they're one of like many people sniping at you and you right. know it's like right. one yep. piranha can't take you out but a lot of them can um and i think that one of the things that is better now about it than before is when all that stuff first started those of us who are making content for the internet videos and podcasts mm -hmm. and and social media we thought we had to we thought we had to not censor stuff in the comments right. and we thought we had to read the comments and i think that realizing now that um that when you do this kind of presentation it's like throwing a party you wouldn't throw a party have someone show up and start abusing your other guests and not kick that guy out right right and i i feel Good the analogy. same i feel the same about internet stuff you know yeah. um, if you come to my mm -hmm. social media if you come on a video that i did you are arriving at my party, so be polite to my guests and be polite to me, or I will kick you out and I will not be sorry about it. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it. I agree. Yeah. And I think I think that's very, very true, right? I mean, I, I think over time, and, and by that I'm gonna say the last six years or so, I think it's gotten it's gotten much better. Um, you still have those people that will throw those jabs in for no other reason than they can. Um, but I think you know, if you do this long enough and you spend enough time either in the written word or in front of the camera, you you could disassociate those people. You could push them aside and they, I, I know stuff like that doesn't affect me anymore. I mean, every now and then I'll get a zinger and I'm like, ooh, that, that hurt. But, <laughs> you know, for yeah. the most part, I, I think you do develop that that skin. And then when I, the other good, great part, and I know I've seen this on like on, on your videos and, and stuff that, you know, we've done. Um, it's great when you have your fan base defending you. Yeah, that was a that was always a wonderful thing when that first happened to me. I, you know, somebody would be like, "Musto sucks," and then somebody else would come on and be like, "No, he's all right." And I'm like, "That's the best." It it, <laughs> that, it was this is like the greatest feeling in the world. Oh you know? man, yeah, bless you all. He's all right, yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So okay, so Roadkill happened, did Roadkill, and then after Roadkill, you're you went you obviously did a lot more writing, but all of a sudden now you're doing video for Edmonds, and you've transitioned from old cars and now you're doing new car reviews you're driving <laughs> porsches and you're driving you're driving everything so what was that transition like um it was it was slower than it seems because um you know it there had been a little bit of new car stuff already just with even at the end of the hot rod stuff we were starting to because they were bringing back muscle cars right like how right. do you not you know how do you not cover the hellcat when it comes out how do you not cover right. the gt 500 so um, so I was already a little bit paying attention to, to new car stuff. And, and certainly I was reading, you know, just everything again. Like I, I feel like, I feel like as a woman, I, I, I needed to be more educated than the average person doing this job because yep. I could, I didn't know what people were going to try and kind of catch me on. Right. Um, okay. Now, again, going back, I'd like to tell previous me or anybody else who's out there starting to do this, like, you don't have to prove yourself to anyone. Do stuff because it, it's interesting to you. Luckily, it was interesting to me. But And then even now, I, I, um, I try to set aside one day a month where I just read stuff, read stuff on all the different websites, go idea. through my yeah. magazines. You know, just, I don't, I'm not a numbers memorizer. So if, you know, if you're like, hey, you know, what's the horsepower in the, <laughs> you know, what's the horsepower in the 911 Targa? I, I'd be like, uh, allow me to Google that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> right. Like, I feel like it's fine. It's enough. Um, right. <laughs> but I do like to sort of have an idea of, of what's out there and what's new and, um, and what kind of cars are good for what kind of people. 
Sure. You know, wh why right. do people like certain things? What What's interesting to them about it? And and that was very interesting moving to new car stuff because I basically started on like, um, I mean, I've always avoided calling it this in print, but I, I started on like the mommy review track. Like I was doing right. SUVs and mini minivans yeah. and, um, and it was at first I was like, I don't want to do this, but then it was it was interesting because it was all this stuff that I'd never paid attention to before. All right. this safety like couple, tech and like cup holders yeah. and stuff, right? Like you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, and I mean, and more than that, though, like you know, um, just stuff like 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 seat adjustability and comfort right. and visibility and sound, uh, cargo space, ease of use of like figuring right. out infotainment systems i mean it was all stuff where stuff. yeah you know like before i'd be like oh viper acr i don't i don't care what it feels right. like or how the radio works because that is viper not, acr not yeah. Important. yeah yeah <laughs> um but you know when you're in like a honda pilot or something you're gonna be like oh this is this is an interesting door that covers yeah. this this storage compartment or the storage compartment is interesting because you can actually put like an entire small cooler yeah. in it and, so now, did you see, Alana, did you see when you were doing these reviews that, and I think Mike and I talk about this for every so often too, like mm -hmm. when, when you're faced with a lot more constriction or restriction to your creative process, it, it makes a better creative product, right? As opposed to, Hey, that Viper or, you know, that GT 500 or that new Hellcat, it's kind of easy to, in some ways you can kind of say, well, that thing just writes itself or the video <laughs> just makes itself. Right. But if you're faced with like a brand new, uh, you know, SUV or a brand new minivan, and all of a sudden you got to find some ways to make this thing. I don't want to say cool, but like interesting, then all of a sudden you've got a lot more to do and a lot more work, like heavy creative work to actually make the thing interesting. Right. I mean, would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, um, if you asked me for my very best stuff, it would probably be more Viper than minivan. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I, do, I do think that it made me get, it made me get like tighter about how yeah. I tell a story. Yeah. And it also, again, made me expand how I'm thinking about what people want and, and try and get outside of my own head yep. and say like, not everyone wants a Viper. And I'm in my, it's still in my heart. I'm like, why not? But, right. but they don't, not everyone wants a Viper. Not everyone even wants like a GT Mustang. Like sometimes people want a car that does something totally different than that. And sure. I don't think that those are bad people or wrong right. about doing car <laughs> but stuff. They're, right. But they're such strange creatures, aren't they? <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> bad people, odd people, yes, but not yeah. bad people. Yeah. So. All right, so you're doing the new car stuff, and then all of a sudden, you take a shift. You go back to muscle, Wait, kind what of. Was that, what was that, Mike? Take a, take a shift. Okay, got it. Did that go come ahead. across? Did that I, sound totally? I was just making. I was just getting a clarification. If that right? sounded what I thought, just okay. Take, <laughs> okay. S h i f t. Got it. Got it. That's got it. Yes. Understood. Thanks for pointing that out, Dan. Yep. Just doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're writing an autobiography on Don Prudhomme, Don the Snake Prudhomme. So like you go from Vipers and new cars to all of a sudden now you're doing this for the snake, which is like, and for those who, if you don't know who Don the Snake Prudhomme is, anybody listening, do a Google search, dive, dive in, and then obviously pick up the book that Alana <laughs> has just written. That's but how did that come about? Um, that one is funny because obviously it's connected to Hot Rod, but it goes before Hot Rod, which is, um, so Tom and I were very into ramp trucks and car haulers mm -hmm. and Don Prudhomme was restoring the Snake and Mongoose Hot Wheels car haulers and the NHRA magazine was occasionally doing updates on it. Phil Burgess would have a post up about ramp yeah. trucks or he would have a post up about Don Prudhomme and his ramp trucks. And that was way before I was at Hot Rod. I mean, I was, I think, maybe doing PR still. But um, okay. And we got an invite from a, a friend who had a car club, and his car club was going down to Perdome's shop in Vista, down by San Diego. And he was like, "Why don't you guys come along? You like, you know, you like that yeah. stuff." <laughs> so we go That's down cool. there, and uh, 
and Perdome is there um, leading this tour and it's not a very big club and everyone else is like kind of just wants like signatures or whatever. Yeah. I don't even remember like, but Tom and I were like, can we see the trucks? And he was like, eyes got all big and happy because he had just finished them. Yeah. And so he like shows us the trucks and he let me sit in them. And, um, and then he showed me the, the white funny car and he answered all my That's questions. Helpful. And I could tell that he was like really stoked yeah. that I was into it, you know? Um, because I think he was, I mean, I know now, but like, I think he gets, all of those people get pretty bored with just signing yeah. their name and answering like the same question every time from someone sure. who hasn't done any real reading or research and is yeah. just kind of like trying to come up with something to ask a, a famous person. Um, and so, so then once I'm at Hot Rod, I get assigned to cover the Shelby Memorial. It was right after Shelby passed away and Prudhomme mm -hmm. was there. And at that point, Tom and I had just bought Dick Landy's old ramp truck. Yeah, so we, sure. we had just Literally. got a ramp yeah. truck project. And are you Prudhomme, telling me that you own Dandy Dick Landy's ramp truck? Absolutely. Do you, yes, do you, she still, does. Have, you still have this yeah. thing? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen it in person. Oh, I'm yes. coming down to see this thing. Yeah, please do. Oh, um, awesome. We actually have two ramp trucks now because we also um, we got another one. Um, so. So Prudhomme is at this memorial and I, I walked over and like, I didn't want to interrupt him, but I didn't know if he would remember me or whatever, but I was sort of like, Hey, um, you might want to know that I, you know, we, I told you I was looking for a ramp truck and then I, we bought one and he like, he's like, do you have pictures? And then he like pulled me aside of this like whole big, I mean, this is a big event. He yeah. pulls it to the side and he makes me show him all the pictures. And then he makes me like text him the pictures so that he can show Roland Leong. And he's like, next time I'm in the Valley, can I come see it? And, so um, good. and so then we kind of became friends. He was interested in what we were doing on the, on the truck and he would sure. come up to the Valley cause he still had friends from the Valley cause he grew up here. Mm -hmm. and, and Alana, by the way, what is that truck? What the, the, the Dick Landy truck that you've got, what is that thing? Can you describe it for us? Yeah. Okay. So it's a Dodge D seven hundred, which is not quite a semi truck. So it's right. not like if you can picture, um, I don't know. I guess maybe like a duel, like the movie duel, like a box like, truck cab, something like that. Yeah. It's, or is it or more yeah. than that? No, no. It's it's probably more like a box truck cab, but like there are bigger yeah. trucks. It's not the biggest truck. It's not like a semi truck. It but it looks like a giant. Um, like a giant version of a, a normal Dodge pickup. Sure. So right, it still sure. has like a Dodge pickup shape to the cab. Okay. But then the back, um, instead of being like a flatbed, is uh, a ramped body with like T tops up at the at the top, like yes. a tire box yep. that like goes yep. over the cab. Mm -hmm. It's a crew cab, and then like big ramps, and then you like pull the the yeah. separate ramps down, like lay them on the ground, then you can bring a race car up on the. Um, on the ramps, and then you can go down the road to your next drag race. Um, and so and, he so, go ahead, Dan. Sorry, I was going to say. And how did you end up with that thing? Not to derail the entire conversation, but <laughs> how did you get this thing? I'm oh, dying. Okay. That, is, that is a that is like a story, a really good story, all by itself. So I'm not going to tell it all right now. We'll, it's, wait, it's we'll wait for the book. Yeah, we'll wait but, for the um, book. Yeah. But basically, we were looking for one for a long time, and we and we followed like a set of. Like we just sort of followed rumors. Like someone would yeah. say, like I heard this guy was selling this two years ago, or this or that. And like um, Tom did a bunch of crazy internet research, and eventually sent a letter to an address where we thought the ramp truck might be. Yeah. Wow. And that guy called, and we uh, wow. and we ended up buying it. God, so that's so awesome. <laughs> it's a so, big that, project. We're still we've been working on it now for whatever it is, six seven years. So. That you've got the ramp truck. That's kind of the impetus of how your conversations with Don started. And then now you, you're writing his book, right? So did he actually request you to write the book? Like, is that how that, like, he's like, yeah, I think I'm going to do a book, but I want a lot of them to write it. Is that how that <laughs> kind of happened? Uh, yes. I mean, it's out. I like, I know that's so crazy, but that's exactly how it happened. Um, I mean, we did a lot of stories at Hot Rod. Like after right. we, you know, became friends, we did a lot of stories and, and like, he would always be my go-to if I had a drag racing question because he's he's right. very good at answering that kind of stuff. You know, he okay. sometimes he'll talk to 
to someone who's a legend in their field and they really are only interested in answering stuff about themselves. Right. Um, and I don't blame them for that, right? Like, sure. you know, but Don's always been very good at, at being like, oh, like on a, in a bigger picture, who did this or who did that? Or, right. Um, so we worked on a lot of stories together and, you know, we'd hang out at the, at the races and stuff, just kind of catch up later. Sometimes I'd go to dinner with him and Roland and right. some of the other drag racers. And, you know, and we'd talk and then, um, you know, and sometimes we talk about stuff that he wasn't ready to have in a story yet, you know, like, um, and that was sort of what happened with the book. We, we did a big profile for Haggerty magazine. Okay. And in that profile, he said, I'm right. He said, I'm ready to talk about how I only recently found out that I, that I'm black, that I have black relatives. Okay. And that was a huge deal to him because growing up and racing, he never identified as black. Um, Interesting. He, you know, he, his family, his own parents told him that they were white, mm -hmm. that they just had dark hair. He didn't know. And, um, and it really wasn't until his sister did DNA tests and stuff that mm. they met this whole other side of his family. And he was sort of like, wow, this is a big deal to me. And if you look at... If you look at like drag racing forums and stuff, people have wondered about it. It's oh, been yeah. like a it's been a conversation, but not something that that anybody had ever really it. asked him. So yeah. it's always like topic number six, you know, when, <laughs> you, when you read up anything about you know about the, the snake, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it comes up like if you Google <laughs> right. him, a lot of times it'll be like like racial background or heritage mm, right. or whatever. Right. And so there was just a couple of lines in the Haggerty story where you know he mentioned it, and then. I guess uh, the Cartech, the book publisher, want to talk to him about wanting to do a, a biography. Yeah. They had somebody in mind. And Don called me and he said, they want to do a book. I don't want to work with the guy that they have because he lives far away. And right. he's like, I think that would be weird. You know, like he's not going to be able to come out. I don't want to do this all over the phone. Yeah. Um, he said, would you do it? And I was like, I've, not, I've never written a book. I don't want to write a book. And he's like, well, I've never written a book either. So we'll be, you know, we'll be in the same place on this. And uh, yeah, that's, so we what did an amazing, What an amazing thing. So now the book, the book is complete. Is that correct? So is it out? Could people go buy it now? You can pre-order it now from any of the big places that do pre-orders or, you know, bound by by morality to say or at your local bookstore um okay. your local independent bookstore okay. um and then it should be in bookstores in october and what yeah. is the title of the book um don prudhomme my life be on the 1320 yeah my life be on the 1320 <laughs> okay we're well, sure about this <laughs> no, i'm not i'm not sure about it i didn't write the title um, that sounds like some yeah. committee nonsense right there right um, yeah like <laughs> You know, they wanted it to, they wanted to make sure people knew it wasn't just about racing. So, yeah, that's um, fair. but basically yeah. it's, you know, if you look up Don Perdomo autobiography, it's. And how many years, time. how many years of, of your life did you spend on this thing, Alana? Um, a year and a half. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah we could have probably cool. used, we could have used another six months. I think we could have got a lot more photographs now that we're done. People keep sending me these amazing photographs. Like, Where were work? you before? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Okay, now I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I am going to go to the topic of the Pontiac Trans Am. Of course you are. Of course I am. Now, you have a turbo car. Now, Alana and I, for anybody who doesn't know, Alana, Alana has an 81 turbo Trans Am. I have a 79 403 66 Trans Am. We actually did a mock drag race. <laughs> Which was amazingly slow. I was gonna say, who was slower on that race? It, I it, was. Yeah, but it was. There's. A, you only had two gears. Yeah. You didn't. You didn't have second gear. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh I'm not. I'm not sure we even got to second. <laughs> so yeah, well, it's, I think that's true. But one of the things um, that we've been talking about is to we need to do a full on. Trans Am comparison, and I am so looking forward to making this video with you 
to doing that. Oh my it God, it's going to be, be so fun. It's going to be so good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm throwing that out there to the audience because I want them to, I'm just seeding it now for them so that they understand that you're going to see an epic Trans Am video eventually. Well, and it's going to be so epic too because so when you're doing performance comparison videos, there's always like a little part of you that is anxious because you're <laughs> you're comparing like these pretty major performance cars and it, it's, you know, it's dangerous. People crash mm -hmm. cars, you're going really fast and like mm -hmm. you're concentrating on getting a shot and you're trying to drive cars next to each other and stuff. I am not worried about that I know. with our trans <laughs> I was gonna say, It just sounds like a whole lot of TA on TA violence that's about yeah. <laughs> going down. Performance. But for the word performance is a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Well, I think when we call it that, and Take I mean some liberties with that. Yeah, I mean the, the drag race we had, you could have measured it. Let's put it this way: you could have eaten a sandwich at the time that it took us to get to the finish line. But it yeah, was still. Fact, I'm pretty sure that was it. Chris, who was with us? Somebody, somebody did. Yeah, <laughs> was eating yeah, a sandwich. It, it, was, it was. It was amazing. So, but we're gonna do a full on, full on video of that. Um, but now I'm just, I'm just trying to think. So, okay. You've done so. What What are you doing now? What are you going to do next? Like I know, <laughs> and I'll I'll throw out a little tidbit. Um, a lot. You're you are going to see myself, Dan, and Alana doing some stuff in the future with Hemmings. I'm just letting you all know that right now. So get ready. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what, dun, dun, dun. but just understand that it's going to happen, right? Um, and you're most likely going to see Tom in there as well, Mr. Tom, who's also amazing. Um, so until that happens, what can we expect from you? What else, what are you, what are you working on right now? What do you got in the pike? What should we look forward to? <laughs> um, you know, I just today did a, a list of like everything that I have as like a pending assignment. Um, yeah. cause I was like, oh gosh, I don't really, I, I, do I need to pitch stuff? And then I like wrote down everything I'm working on. And I was like, oh, I do not need to pitch stuff. I have a lot <laughs> going on. Um, so I'm still doing stuff with Edmonds, which, you know, I really, I enjoy, you know, I think. I was sort of dismissive of the minivans, but like I said, I learn a lot and it, that's a great team. And it's fun to get to be on video with a great team. So yeah. more video. And um, and then I've been doing a column for Car and Driver, uh, okay. which, which feels, you know, again, talking about like moments where you're just like, yeah, like, can I go back in time and tell the me who like, yeah, didn't get paid for my first article that I'm going to be a, a freaking columnist in a major magazine? with yeah. like the little drawing and I have nice hair in it and stuff. <laughs> anyway, so that's pretty great. I just turned in one about, I went to Bonneville this year um, for mm -hmm. Speed Week and I hung out with the uh, Speed Demon Land Speed Racing team and they went um, they went 481 miles an hour. They set a record, a new record for fastest piston driven engine car at 470 miles an hour. Um, 470, like it doesn't. That, that's it doesn't really compute. Yeah. No, that's right. that's that's booking. That's airliner like, speed, right? I mean, that's yeah. Like, it's right, so that's... fast that you can um, blow a hole in the engine at the third mile and still go 450 at the fifth mile. That's how fast it is wow. because they did that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you know, I'm definitely always trying to get you know, get that motorsports, get that old car, right. get that history stuff in, um, doing some stuff for, for road and track and for the, there's a new right. magazine called R and T, which is connected mm -hmm. to road and track. So doing some stuff for them. Yep. And, um, you know, so it's a nice mix of new car and old car stuff. Um, okay. I do a regular, uh, interview with, um, sports car market. So um, that's that's been really fun. They've been they've had me on a on a kick of interviewing a bunch of women in collector car stuff, and there are a ton okay. of cool women who are doing collector car stuff. So I've been learning a lot about Ferraris and Bugattis recently. Well, do me a favor and, and shoot Dan and I the contact information because we'd love to have them on. I will. Great. I will. That I will. would be yeah, fantastic. They're great. Um, They're great. Okay, so we're coming up just about, wow. That was an hour. That was no, it goes that so was a, fast. Wow, it goes so quick fast. Hour. Um, it's faster okay, so, than both of your TAs, by the way. It's it. That's I mean, very nice everything does. Like, but if it's we true. had started, we started this race at the beginning of the podcast, we could have had the whole podcast from inside right. of the cars, and we would just now be crossing the end just of the now crossing. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's probably true. That's probably true. So, 
online, wh- where can everybody find you? So on social media, where should they look? What, what are your handles? All that fun, exciting stuff. Well, uh, luckily for me, uh, there doesn't seem to be anybody else with the name Alana Share. Um, I think there's a ballerina named Alana Shore. So basically, if it's like a hot, tall girl in a tutu, it's not me. Is that me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so, I mean, just, just looking up Alana Share will, will get you pretty much everything I've ever done. Okay. But if you want to hang out with me on social media, it's Challenge Her. Um, so like Challenger, mm-hmm. except with an H in there. And then if you want to see what Tom and I are working on, because we never even got to really talk about that, but we've got a ton oh, of projects. Right. Okay. Um, we're, we're on YouTube at Challenge Her as well. So we've okay. been kind of just doing like little uh, intro videos to the different projects we have. So you can always check that stuff out. So well. go through the projects in 30 seconds. Give us the projects you're working on. 30 seconds. Okay. There's the Trans Am. There's the Dick Landy ramp truck. There's the Bobby Yule ramp truck. Um, we have a yellow uh, crew cab Dodge Dually. We have a ever. 64 Ford Wrecker. Um, I have a 71 Opal. We have a 69 Dodge Polara that I have to get ready to sell to you, Mike. Um, <laughs> I have a 70 Challenger. We have a 71 uh, 440 Shaker Cuda. And um, Tom has a 69 RT Charger. I think. Right. So uh, is that it? it? No, no, but that, that's the that's the bulk of it. That's the bulk. The good okay. Stuff. So so there you go, everyone. Um, like I said, look for everything Alana Shore on on social, in the magazines, everywhere else. Truly one of the best writers out there. Pick up uh, the new book about Prudhomme because that that's going to be amazing. We all know this. Um, and Alana, thank you so much for coming on. Like I <laughs> yeah, said, this was like the quickest so hour ever. This is great. Thanks for having me, guys. I mean, an hour to get to talk all about myself. Great. <laughs> <laughs> all right and we will talk to you soon and uh yeah can we and again everybody just stay tuned because alana will be doing some stuff with hemmings i promise you that oh that's it's right. gonna so, be good that's it's right. gonna be good <laughs> see you soon thanks alana